Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host for the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Joining me in our podcast studios this week is Dr. Berenice Mugia Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez is uh, joining us from the Diagnostic Lab at Iowa State University, where she is currently working as a veterinarian and a PhD student studying PERS PCR diagnostics. Welcome to the podcast, Berenice. Would you like to give an uh, introduction of yourself to the audience? Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and thank you very much for having me. Of course. Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm a veterinarian. I obtained my DVM degree back in Mexico in 2019. And then in 2021, I came here to Iowa State University to pursue my master's in veterinary preventive medicine with Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Jimenez Lirola as my major professors. And well, I just defended my master's last December. So I'm currently a PhD student in population sciences in animal health as well in, in Iowa State University. So my research is focused, as you mentioned, in PCR diagnostics, more specifically on PERS PCR improvements in different swine specimens, um, how to use endogenous controls in PCR to monitor sample quality, um, testing the effects of external factors in samples and how does that affect to PERS detection. I think we can later touch on that, but I will say that the rationale behind all of these studies is derived from the fact that many on-farm decisions are taken based on final PCR testing, and that's why accurate results are vital in order to make appropriate decisions, especially if we consider that we receive about 80,000 submissions annually just for first PCR testing, and that's counting five different VDLs here in the U.S. So there's a lot of demand for these tests, and that's why we need constant improvement for these diagnostics in order to provide better results. So, yep, that's basically it. But as I recall from my veterinary training, Berenice, you really need uh, uh, two questions to do a good diagnostic investigation. One is, what's the sample that we are going to send to the lab, and how are we going to handle that sample to make sure we get a good answer? Two is you certainly need to have a plan for the answer you get. You need to know what you're going to do with the results one way or the other. But to your point, because the plan is so dependent on the results, we have to get that sample type correct. We have to get that sample correctly handled and sent to the diagnostic lab so we get good results and make good decisions. Could you talk a little bit about your research on sample quality and the handling of the samples and what you have found in terms of sample handling that can impact the PERS PCR results and accuracy of the of the testing. Sure. So first of all, why PERS? Um, I think it goes without saying that it's the most economically important disease here in the United States. And since it's an RNA virus, um, we know that RNA viruses are more prone to degradation of DNA virus. So essentially we perform um, two different studies here from the premise, again, that accuracy of PERS PCR testing is crucial in order to assure quality results, especially um, in South Herds for monitoring or surveillance programs. So I think overall the question was, how do we assure quality results in PERS PCR? So one of the first studies was to test the use of a portion specific endogenous controls for a PERS testing. And when I say endogenous controls, I'm referring on targeting a pig specific gene along with PERS RNA in this case. And this pig specific gene is also called housekeeping gene that must be present in any swine derived specimen or a fluid, serum samples, processing fluids, tissue, and feces. So, since this, this gene is targeted along with PERS RNA, um, we will have in our PCR two results, right? One is for PERS and the other one for these controls. Why uh, or how does that help us to monitor sample quality? Because we need to detect this gene constantly. Um, so we know that the videos have actually their own controls that are used to monitor any problem that could happen in the laboratory. That is, they include external um, controls for extraction, controls for the amplification part, but that only accounts for variations that could happen within the laboratory between technician variation, contamination, any issues with the equipment or the reagents, so on and so forth. 
But we need to keep in mind that there's a whole process before the sample actually arrives to the laboratory. And that's from the moment of sample collection, storage in farm, was the sample stored at 4 degrees or at minus 20 degrees in the farm, then sample shipment by air or by ground, sample reception in the laboratory, sample processing, storage before um, the test, and finally the PCR testing. So through all of these procedures, um, samples are exposed to a lot of conditions that we can globalize in either exposing the samples at temperatures over time or just freeze cycles. And although recommendations for proper sample handling to optimize detection, not only for PERS, but for any other pathogen, necessarily includes to chill or freeze the sample after collection and then maintaining the cold chain until the final arrival to the laboratory, it's not always logistically possible to meet all of these recommendations. And in contrast, samples can be exposed under less than ideal conditions that we can again summarize in storage temperatures or fiscal cycles. So by the use of these endogenous controls targeting a peak specific gene, we can monitor if the sample was mishandled. We cannot answer what happened to the sample, but we know that if we fail to detect this gene on the sample, something is going on either with the sampling or also during the testing procedures. So in either case, um, if this control is not coming up, we will recommend to either retest or resample. So if we combine the use of these endogenous controls with the already established controls by the VDLs, we can enhance the final PCR results. And that's preventing false and negative results that can be translated in more precise decisions taken on farms on any first surveillance or monitoring program. Excellent. And I would assume, um, Dr. Berenice, that uh, this sort of control could apply to any assay. You could, you could use the same control process for PED testing or for even um, uh, control program diseases such as ASF, foot and mouth disease. You could use this to gain confidence that the sample was collected from a pig population and that the samples have been handled reasonably well and should yield accurate results. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the use of these controls is not a new concept, but they are mostly used for gene expression studies in human or veterinary side. They're not widely used on the diagnostic part, but we know that they have been used, for instance, uh, for African swine fever virus. In this case, the control that we tested was from a commercial assay, and I think that will be the goal for the rest of the, the other commercial PCRs. But yes, it's not a new concept. It has been used for African swine fever virus, e either for um, avian influenza virus. So yeah, it can, can be applied to any pathogen, any species. Have you had conversations with your colleagues at the diagnostic lab about how this control, this updated control, might be included in routine diagnostic testing? Um, for example, would it be something that I, as a veterinarian, would have to specifically request for the lab to use on my PERS uh, assay? Or would it be something you just implement, you add it to the existing control plates already on the PCR well, and it's going to happen behind the scenes whether I request it or not? Yeah, I will say that the best thing to do will be to always have this control. So um, in case, in that case, it won't be on the request, but it must be just always added to the routinary PCR reaction. But that's the goal. That's the goal. How, how far away are we from that? Is that, uh, is that years away from now, or is it something more in the near future we could potentially see? Well, my expectations are to add these controls in the near future. They are actually included on research PCRs, but there's really commercial essays that includes the use of these controls. So I'm hoping that at least it won't take years, but just a short period of time to start implementing that on the VDL side. Very good. Tremendous work. I think it's a, a very um, wonderful idea, and I really appreciate um, the, the innovation that it took to bring this forward. Um, and to your point at the beginning of this podcast, we make a lot of decisions based on PERS diagnostic results. Um, things that are as big as, as guilt movements, bore movements, right? Things that can impact millions of dollars of negative consequence if we make a decision based off bad information. And the worst case scenario is somebody sends in samples that weren't collected from a pig or that were collected from a pig but mishandled and they are not going to be representative of the disease situation. We get a negative result and we think everything's good, but the reality is something wasn't good. So I, I really appreciate your effort in trying to help um, producers to prevent making those bad decisions. 
And I want to thank you uh, very much for coming on the show and, and to our audience. Thank you for thank you for listening to the Swine Elf Black Belt podcast. Uh, if you haven't visited us at our website, please check us out at swineelfblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss out on next week's episode. For Dr. Berenice Mungia Ramirez, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com, and we would love to take a look at your research.